Bishop Robert Barron is the founder of Word on Fire Catholic Ministries and Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. He's also the host of Catholicism, a groundbreaking, award-winning documentary about the Catholic faith. Bishop Barron is a number one Amazon best-selling author, no less, and has had his books uh, sold over 400,000 copies. He's a religion correspondent for NBC and has also appeared on Fox News, Donald Trump's favorite waste of time. Um, <laughs> well, it is, isn't it? <laughs> CNN, succeeding news, <laughs> and EWTN. Now, Bishop Barron's website, wordonfire.org, reaches millions of people each year, and he's one of the world's most followed Catholics on social media. His regular YouTube videos have been viewed over 30 million times, and he has over 1.5 million followers on Facebook. Take that, Donald Trump. Well, God bless you all. Thank you very much, and good morning. What an uplifting thing for me just to see so many of you here. I was up in Scotland a couple of days ago. Any uh, Scotsmen here? I was up at uh, the Usher Hall in Edinburgh and spoke to about 2,500 people there, and they were just wonderful. But to see now even more here uh, lifts me up spiritually. And I'm so glad the uh, Archbishop, thank you, by the way, Archbishop McMahon and Cardinal Nichols for having me. Uh, I'm so glad he mentioned the Beatles, because when I come to Liverpool, Man, the Beatles, when I was about 12 years old, I discovered the Beatles, and they followed me my whole life long. Uh, <laughs> I was here about five years ago for the first time, and I just made a beeline to John Lennon's house, to Paul McCartney's house, and then to the Cavern Club, which I loved. Went down there and listened to some music, and I bought, when I was there, this really cool uh, photo of the Beatles, and I put it up in my office when I was rector at Mundelein Seminary. Anyone here from Leeds, by the way? Okay, well, your former bishop, uh, bishop, Arthur Roach, is a friend of mine. And Arthur came to see me when I was rector, and he walked in and he said, Ma, you have a picture of the Beatles. <laughs> and I said, well, sure, I love the Beatles. And he said, do you know I saw the Beatles in the Cavern Club when I was 17? And that gave me a whole deeper appreciation for Arthur Roach. <laughs> but... Um, Gosh, thanks for your presence, thanks for your exuberance today. It means a lot, I think, for the church, which, as you know, is going through a painful time. And during these periods, I think it's so important that we return to the fundamentals, and that means, above all, Christ and the Eucharist. And so wonderful that we are gathering to celebrate, to speak about, to understand more deeply the Eucharist. And what I'm going to talk about, everybody, in this brief time we have, is this splendid mystery of the Mass. As you know, Vatican II called us to realize the Mass as the source and the summit of the Christian life. The Vatican II fathers wanted a revival of the Mass, which is why I think a lot of them are turning in their graves at the situation today. In my country, maybe 20% of Catholics go to Mass. I think it's even worse over here in Europe, isn't it? To think that you know, 75 or 80% of our brothers and sisters in the Catholic faith Stay away from the source and summit of the Christian life. Something's the matter. Calling us back to the Mass, reviving the sense of this full, conscious, and active participation in this supreme mystery is a central concern of the Church at all times, and especially now. You know, my conviction, just based now on many years of being a priest and now a few years as a bishop, is that even a lot of Catholics who come to Mass often, I think, don't quite appreciate what it is. Oh, a sort of religiously themed jamboree around the theme of Jesus, you know. But what the Mass is, this supreme mystery. So what I want to do is just begin with a few general remarks about the Mass, and then briefly walk through the great moves of the liturgy so we can deepen our appreciation of what it's all about. 
Here's a first general observation about the Mass. The Mass, I think, is the privileged encounter with Jesus Christ. See, mind you, Christianity is not a philosophy, is it, primarily? It's not a, a political movement or a social theory. Christianity is a relationship with a person. It's a friendship with Jesus Christ. There is no more intense encounter with the Lord than the Mass. Think about this, everybody. When you meet with someone, you meet with a friend, or friends are coming over to your house, what do you typically do? Well, typically, we talk for a while, right? The guest doesn't come and you say, oh, by the way, here's dinner, sit down, you know. We, we talk for a while, we visit, we speak and we listen. And then, typically, we sit down for a meal. So, I would say, in this great encounter with Jesus Christ, first we talk and then we eat. First we listen and we speak back, we converse with the Lord, and then we sit down at the great banquet of the Lord's table. It's the privileged moment of encounter. Here's a second general observation about the Mass, and I've used the word already a couple of times. The Mass is the supreme mystery. You know, we say, let us prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries, don't we? I like Abbot Jeremy Driscoll's definition of a mystery. Here's what he says. A mystery is a concrete something that when you bump into it, it puts you into contact with a divine reality. That's good, isn't it? It's a concrete something, so it's, it's oil, it's water, it's wine, it's bread, etc., that when you bump into it, puts you into contact with a divine reality. Everything in the Mass, from candles to cross to vestments to gesture to, to uh, symbol, etc., all of it is a mystery. It's a, it's, a, it's a series of mysteries, concrete somethings that when we bump into them, put us into contact with the divine reality. Here's a third uh, general remark about the Mass, and I get this from the great liturgical theologian Romano Guardini. Guardini said the Mass is the supreme form of play. The supreme form of play. Now, what did he mean? He meant play is the most serious thing in life. Now, why? It's counterintuitive, I know. But there are useful things in life, things we do for the sake of something else, right? So I get my car fixed that I might be able to drive it somewhere and enjoy some place or some people I want to see. The fixing of the car is subordinate to those further ends. People work on these microphones so that I might be able to speak this, uh, uh, this lecture. Those are useful things. But then play. Things like listening to the Beatles, for example, is a form of play. Why? It, well, it's not subordinate to some end beyond itself. It's simply good in itself. It's beautiful. Reading the comics, you know, like in the newspaper, we think, oh, the serious sections, dealing with politics and business. But see, that's all practical, useful material. The serious parts of the paper, really, I would say, are, are the comics and the sports page. Because they deal with useless things. And, and that's high praise. That's high praise. When I was teaching philosophy many years ago, I'd always tell the first year students, Welcome to the most useless class you will ever take. <laughs> but of course, I meant it as the highest praise to philosophy. Those kind of questions, they're not useful. It's just beautiful in itself to ask and answer them. So with the Mass, so with the Mass. It's the most supremely useless thing we do because it's the highest thing we do. Wasting time with God. Sitting uselessly with the Lord. Yep, that's the Mass, the highest form of play. Here's another general comment, and I'm glad right behind me, we adoremos, the great title, let us adore, right? The Mass is the supreme form of worship or adoration. Go back to the year 2005, Pope Benedict was speaking in Cologne at World Youth Day, and he told the young people there, that the etymology of the word adoration is very interesting. Adoratio in Latin, right? 
ad ora means, sorry, means mouth to mouth. To the mouth of, ad oratio. When we adore, we are mouth to mouth with God. See what I mean? It means we're aligned unto God, ordered unto God. I think the master theme of the entire Bible is adoration, is teaching first Israel, then the whole world, how properly to adore the Lord. Because by implication, when we adore something other than God, we're mouth to mouth with money or with power or with pleasure, with honor, with country, whatever it is, then we disintegrate, we tend to fall apart. But when we adore the Lord, we're aligned unto God, mouth to mouth to God, then we become rightly ordered on the inside and peace tends to break out around us. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. Do you see how that's kind of a formula? If I give glory to God above everything else, I adore Him alone, then peace breaks out in me and around me. The Mass, everybody, is the supreme form of worship. You know that word uh, comes from an older English word, worthship. Worthship. What's of highest worth to you? When we come to Mass, what we're saying, look, with our very bodies, is Christ is of highest worth to me. And in that great act, I become rightly ordered. That's what the Mass is about. One more, one more general observation. The Mass is a great call and response between Christ the head and all of us the members of his mystical body. Go back in the Old Testament to the great Song of Songs, that love poem, right, between two young people. And you hear this delicious call and response, one calling out to the other, the other calling back. And in that process, they grow in their love. So the Mass is a call and response between Christ the head and the members of his mystical body. And I'll say more about it as I go today. But in that process, the mystical body becomes more tightly connected unified, all of us gathered now together under the headship of Christ. But we come to Mass to hear him call out to us in love, and then we respond to him with an answering love. Okay? Those are, are just some general remarks about what the Mass is. But now what I want to do in the remainder of the talk is just to sort of walk through this great liturgy this thing that we're so familiar with, but often we don't uh, think about sufficiently. And I'll need a little drink of water before I start. Okay, let's talk first about the introductory rites of the Mass. You know, in some ways, everybody, the Mass begins before it begins. Now, what I mean is, by the very act of gathering, we are experiencing a mystery. We come together for Mass from all social groups, all different educational levels, all different backgrounds, all different races, the two genders, etc. We come together in our great diversity to this one place for this one act. In that very act of coming together, what's being expressed is the church. A lovely Greek word for church, ekklesia, right? And our terms ecclesiastical and all that come from that word. Ekklesia is based on two Greek words, ek and kalein. It means to call out from. The church, the ecclesia, is a community which has been called out from something into something else. It's been called out from the world, if I can use biblical language. Out from the world of hatred and violence and division and stratification and us against them 
and who's better and who's up and who's down. The world that we know all too well. We are ekkaleod out of that world into a new space, the space of the church. And you see it, don't you, as the church gathers. You know, Dorothy Day, the, the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, is a great hero of mine. And Dorothy Day, when she was considering becoming a Catholic, said she was deeply moved by the fact that in the Catholic Church, she saw all the different economic levels, all the different educational backgrounds. Everyone seemed to come together. It was the ecclesia that was moving her. And so the Mass begins really before it begins. We tend to commence the Mass with singing, don't we? Now, don't think of singing at the Mass as merely decorative. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little traveling music as the priest comes up the aisle, you know? See, the singing is extraordinarily important. Why? Because it's one of the ways that this new ecclesia expresses itself. Here are all of us in our different voices, but coming together, oddly, in this harmony. Here's something I've actually asked um, musical friends of mine about. Isn't it weird that in this room, 99% of us are pretty bad singers, right? In this room. I mean, there's a handful who are really good singers. But, but nevertheless, when we sing together, isn't it weird that we don't sound too bad? <laughs> you know, we sing a hymn together and, and hey, it sounds pretty good. But it's sort of like, you know, here are, here are uh, uh, you know, 12 football players and, and they're all individually lousy, but when they play as a team, they're great. I mean, that just doesn't work, does it? Uh, but it works weirdly when it comes to singing. So in our singing, we express the harmonic quality of the ecclesia. Something else, too, about singing, and it, it echoes throughout the liturgy, is our singing here below is meant to be an echo of the heavenly singing. And see, everybody, this is not pious boilerplate. You know, isn't that sweet? We talk about the singing of the angels. No, no, it's very important. Even it's ontologically important. What do I mean? Well, this harmony that comes from right praise, from adoratio, it obtains already in the heavenly realm of the angels and the saints. What do they do all day? Well, for want of a better term, they sing. They sing all day in their harmonic peacefulness together around the throne of God. Now, it's symbolic language I'm using, but you get the point. They live in harmony based upon adoratio. So, so, when we sing, we're meant to echo them. Remember before the, um, the Sanctus, you know, may our voices blend with theirs. May our voices be one with theirs. That's not just pious poetry. That's deep metaphysics, if you want, right? You know, I, um, I, I won't name the, the song, but there's a, a song that I really don't like, and uh, it's been sung now for many years in Catholic churches, and, and one of the lines is, not in some heaven light years away, but here in this place. Do you know the song I'm talking about? That's a terrible line, everybody, because first of all, heaven isn't light years away. That's a silly way to think about it. But, but secondly, no, the Mass is meant to be heaven on earth. It's meant to be the place where heaven meets earth. It's not we're setting up a distinction between, oh, what's way up there somewhere in this irrelevant heaven. No, no, it's when heaven and earth embrace. That's the mass, and the singing expresses that. Okay. The ritual proper begins now with the great sign of the cross, right? Gosh, how important that is. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, that we claim ourselves as belonging to the Trinitarian God. Now, I say especially today, everyone, how important that is. The common view today, especially in the West, is I invent myself. Through my freedom, 
I decide my values, I decide my identity, I decide who I am. Man, is that boring, first of all. That's the problem with it. That's a boring perspective. You know, my little ideas, whole hum. No, no. The beauty of it is, I, I don't belong to myself. I belong to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And see how wonderful that I'm not, as it were, outside of the Trinity, bidding and beckoning. I'm signaling that I live in the Trinitarian love. See, I live in the, in the Holy Spirit that connects the Father and Son in love. And at the beginning of Mass, I signal this great identity. And how wonderful, too, by the way, that I signal it on my body. See, this, we don't, don't play a Gnostic game whereby, oh, the serious stuff is going on inside or spiritually and the body is more of a problem. No, no, no. No, no, God made us body and soul, found all of it good, and I claim with my body and on my body who I am. I belong to the Trinity. It's hugely important. A word now about the, the priest or the bishop who's leading uh, the, the uh, worship of the church. It's so important, everyone, that the priest is not operating in his own name so important. I came of age at a time right after the council when there, there was a kind of cl new clericalism, I think, where the, the personality of the priest uh, came to the fore very much. Now, you know, we're not meant to, to uh, mask our personalities, but symbolically speaking, the fact that I put on vestments that cover up, as it were, my ordinary identity, that I address people not so much as Robert Barron. Robert Barron says hi to you. Uh, this is years and years ago in the States when there was all this liturgical experimentation and there was a priest who began Mass, you know, the Lord be with you. And we, and we said, and also with you. And then he would say, thank you. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding, because we were kids, so we began saying, you're welcome. You know, well, it's, but see that, that's what happens when you forget you're in a ritual space and you're not greeting people in your own name. Rather, you're greeting people in persona Christi Capitis, right? The priest is operating in the person of Christ the head. Remember, I mentioned the head of the mystical body. And when the people respond, and with your spirit, it's not a dualistic thing, like, you know, not with your body, only with your spirit. It doesn't mean that. Thomas Aquinas said that the, the soul is in the body, but not as contained by it, but as containing it. Does that make sense? The spirit contains the body. See? So when you say with your spirit, what you're saying is we're awakening this Christ that through ordination is dwelling in you. See, so the, the call and response between the head and the members of the mystical body begins at the very beginning. What's practically the first thing we do at Mass is we acknowledge our sin. Now, it, it's very good right now because these bright, bright lights are shining on me. I, I really can't see any of you at all. Um, but what's good is, see, as these bright lights are shining on me, what am I noticing? All these little imperfections on my glasses. I can see little scratches and dust particles. And I cleaned them this morning at the hotel. You know, I, I cleaned them up. See, here's the thing about sin. You tend to see your own sin, not when you're driving away from the light, but when you're driving into the light. You know, if you're driving along and, it's, uh, and you're away from the sun, your windshield can look fine, right? Hey, it's clean. But now the next morning, you're driving into the rising sun, and suddenly it's, it's practically opaque. You know, you see so many smudges and all the dirt. So it goes in the spiritual order. Hey, I'm okay and you're okay. Remember that book from the 1970s? Um, I'm glad you don't, actually. <laughs> I'm okay and you're okay. Because that's a stupid thing. You know, I mean, if, if, hey, I'm fine and so are you, we're all great, that means we're riding away from the light, right? But when you've turned toward the light of grace, see, that's precisely when you know you're a sinner. And so at the beginning of Mass, as we turn in adoration toward the light, yeah, we acknowledge our sins. And like Bartimaeus, we cry out, Kyrie eleison, 
You know, in the Bartimaeus story in St. Mark, that's what he says in Greek is, Eleas on me, Eleas on me, have pity on me. And so we're just like Bartimaeus. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Good. You know that uh, there was a song a few years ago by Christina Aguilera, and I, I love the melody, but gosh, the words were awful. It was, um, I'm beautiful in every way, and your words can't bring me down. <laughs> okay, I think we're all beautiful in some ways, but I mean, in every way? I mean, that means I'm driving away from the light. No, no, we, we Christians happily acknowledge our sin, that we're not beautiful in every way, that we stand as forgiven sinners in the presence of the Lord. That's terrific. Um, right after the Kyrie, I've already alluded to it, comes one of the most beautiful prayers in the whole liturgical tradition, and we could do a whole talk based on it, but that Gloria prayer. See, that's the, the stance of adoratio. Glory to God in the highest. Next time you pray that or sing it at Mass, ask yourself, what really is highest to me? Paul Tillich, the Protestant theologian, said, all you need to know about someone you can find out by asking really one question. What do you worship? It's good, isn't it? Everyone worships something. The atheist worships something. Something's of highest worth to you. What do you give glory to the highest to? This prayer is meant to say, to God, to God, to God, and only then will peace break out in me and around me. Think about that, everybody, next time you sing that great prayer of the church. Okay. So those are the introductory rites of Mass, ending, of course, with the great collect prayer. But now we move into the liturgy of the Word. So here's the moment when, in our encounter with Christ, we listen and we speak. How important, first of all, that it's a conversation. We are indeed going to hear the Word speak, but we're going to speak back in all sorts of powerful ways. We're conversing with the Lord. Karl Barth, another of the great Protestant thinkers of the last century, said, the Christian distinctiveness is this odd claim that Deus dixit, that God has spoken. God has spoken. We don't think God is a distant principle. We don't think God is simply some mystical abstraction. No, no. The biblical God is a person who speaks. Now, don't think of voices booming from the clouds. That's a symbol of what I'm talking about. God's a person who speaks, who addresses us. In all of creation, yeah, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. Quite right. In all of human history, yes, in a way, through God's providence. But especially and most powerfully in this holy people Israel, through its prophets and patriarchs, through its great uh, traditions, through the temple and Torah, etc., God has in a much more pointed way spoken to us. And then, finally, and I can't put it better than the author of the Hebrews, in times past God spoke in fragmentary and varied ways to our fathers through the prophets, but in this, the final age, he has spoken to us through his Son, whom he has made heir of all things and through whom he first created the universe. Now, the God who speaks, speaks utterly in and through the Son, his word made flesh. During the liturgy of the word, we listen to this God who speaks to us in this most pointed way. You know, I've already referenced this, but I'll say it again. The, uh, Stanley Hauerwas, the great Methodist theologian, said that the, the standard view today is the only story we have is the one that we make up for ourselves. And that's, the, to me, the sadness of much of modernity. The only story I have is one that I make up. I'll decide. No, no, no. We biblical people know we belong to a greater story. What does Paul say? There's a power already at work in you that can do infinitely more than you can ask or imagine. 
You're part of this great story that God is telling. But learn the contours of it. Learn where you belong in the story of creation, of the fall, of Israel, of the coming of the Messiah. And now we, the church, the prolongation of the incarnation across space and time. See, that's where we belong, everybody. But we need to hear that story told over and over again. That's why so many Catholics staying away from the Mass, of course they start believing all the nonsense they hear. Of course they start believing, yeah, I guess I make up my own story. No, no, we who come to Mass stubbornly sit and listen as the great biblical story is told again and again and again, that we might discover who we are. That makes sense. To be drawn out of our own little self-preoccupation, that we're part of this infinitely more interesting story that God is telling. That's the liturgy of the Word. You know, a word about um, the Old Testament, so the first reading coming invariably from the Old Testament. Friends, one of the earliest heresies the church fought was the heresy of Marcionism. Uh, it might sound like a real arcane reference, but man, is it alive and well today, Marcionism. Marcion was a, a Roman from the second century who taught a version of Christianity in abstraction from the Old Testament. Oh, the Old Testament, that old, you know, those stories about the violent God and all that strange stuff, and let's just jettison all that, and we'll just tell the story of Jesus based on the Gospels. Actually, only certain parts of the Gospels, he thought. Just an ancient thing? Man, I, in my internet work, I run into it all the time. This contempt for the Old Testament. Oh, the violent God, you know, putting the ban on people, and full of anger, and all this business. Let's get rid of that. I like the God of Jesus, this friendly, compassionate God. Well, first of all, you're not reading the New Testament very carefully if that's all you see, right? But from the beginning, Christians realized you're not going to get Jesus right unless you understand the Old Testament. And isn't it true? Every single author in the New Testament talks about Jesus' katatagrapha in Greek, according to the writings. According to the writings. Well, they meant what we call the Old Testament. That's how they read him. So the church, week in, week out, day in, day out, stubbornly reads from this great collection of texts called the Old Testament because we are not Marcionite in our spirituality. Think here of Luke chapter 24, right? The road to Emmaus. What does Jesus do? What sets their hearts on fire when he takes them through the Old Testament and shows the links between those texts and himself? So we do it, everybody, at Mass, week in, week out, day in, day out. We interpret Jesus against that Old Testament background. Okay. Having heard the first reading, now we respond. Now, here's, here's a kind of a pet peeve of mine based on years and years of, of presiding at Mass, is I think way too often people think of the responsorial psalm as now like a little nice musical interlude. You know, so... We've heard this, you know, puzzling thing from the Old Testament. I don't really understand it. And now I'm going to sit back, and, and, the, and now the choir is going to sing a song, or the organist will play a little. No, the, the whole point of the responsorial psalm is that we are now responding to the word that we've heard. I mean, how strange if you had someone over to the house, and they told you a little story, and you just sat there, you know, I mean, you, you respond to them. Hey, that, that's interesting. It was wonderful. Or, oh, how terrible. Or, oh my gosh. And you, you respond to them, right? Well, see, how do we respond? We respond with this brilliant songbook of the church called the Psalms. And now we all know this. Anyone that prays the Psalms. Is there anger in the Psalms? You bet. Is there frustration in the Psalms? Absolutely. Is there exuberant joy in the Psalms? Yes. Is there, is there hatred of one's enemies in the Psalms? Yes. Is there great love for God in the Psalms? Celebration of life in the Psalms? Yes. It's all there. Which is why it's such a splendid book to govern our response to the Word of God. 
So think of that next time you're, you're reciting or better singing the responsorial psalm. It's your talking back to the word who has addressed you. Second reading, invariably an apostolic reading, right? Usually from Paul, but also, I mean, John and James and Peter represent it. Apostolic. We're an apostolic faith. A faith based upon those people who knew him. See how powerful that is. There's always a tendency, everybody, to reduce Christianity to a sort of Gnostic philosophy. Oh, it's a spirituality like many other spiritualities. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> One thing I've always noticed is in the early Christian texts, do they sound to you like people who are kind of musing philosophically on timeless spiritual truth? No. They, they sound like people that want to grab you by the shoulders and tell you something. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> that wonderful quote, uh, it's from a, an Anglican bishop, and uh, he said, when Paul preached, there were riots. When I preached, they served me tea, you know? <laughs> and what he was catching beautifully was how radical the apostolic preaching was, because they were grabbing the whole world by the lapels and saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. Have you heard about this Jesus, this particular Jesus who was crucified by Pilate, but God raised him, that one? See, that's the apostolic quality of our faith, and it's signaled beautifully in the second reading, which is grounded in the apostolic witness. And then finally, of course, we hear from the gospel itself. Here's the word in person speaking. Why beautifully we accompany that proclamation by the alleluia, by, the, by flame and by smoke and so on, with, with heightened solemnity. We, we listen as the word speaks. Now, do we stop responding at this point? No, no. The homily in many ways, and I'm speaking especially now to the priests and bishops, those the deacons who preach. Preaching is a very important moment, I think, in the Mass because it's a kind of bridge. Does the homily further explicate and unpack, as we say, the word of God? Yeah. It's a continuation, if you want. It's an application of the Word of God to the present situation. But you know how in a really good sermon, the preacher is also channeling the fears and aspirations and desires of the people. He's also standing as a kind of representative of the members of the mystical body. He's a bridge figure there. It's the Word spoken, but also our words spoken back. Then the creed. I think way too often people think, well, okay, another interlude, you know, in the mass. Now we're gonna we're gonna pause, and I guess we're gonna recite this old thing from the you know from the fourth century. Uh, this very didactic, theologically sounding thing. No, no. Think of the creed as part of our great response to what we've heard. The creed, if you want, everybody, is a one-page summary of the Bible. You know. It's putting in very laconic doctrinal language a summary of the whole biblical revelation. We hear about creation, we hear about the incarnation, we hear about the dying and rising of Jesus, etc. And what do we say? What do we say? I believe. I believe. I believe. See, next time you're, you're reciting the creed or singing it, don't just think of it as a little interlude. That's your moment. Stand up, having heard the word of God, and you now say, yes, I believe it, I accept it. You know what that means? Of course, so much more than just in your mind. I accept it with my whole body and soul. I believe. It's a very powerful moment. And then, wonderfully, in the prayers of the faithful. Having heard what God has done, in the Old Testament, in the history of salvation, in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. Having heard that great story again, what do we do? We now come back to God with a, with a confident request. Lord, as you've done great things in the past, we are confident you will do great things now. And so we make bold to ask and ask and ask. Do you see how the prayers of the faithful are part of this call and response process?
Okay. With that now, let's turn to the liturgy of the Eucharist. Head and members, having called out to one another, having been knitted together, are now ready to make this great act of sacrifice. Now, I know sacrifice is kind of alien to us. Um, you know, when I was coming of age, uh, we were very big on the, on the banquet and the table of the Lord, etc. And that's essential, as I'll say, to the Mass. It is indeed banquet. It is indeed table of the Lord. We were uneasy with the idea, though, of sacrifice and of altar and of priesthood. That all seemed a little bit alien. You know, they say, by the way, if, if someone today went in a time machine back to ancient times, what would most strike us in, a, in the ancient cities would be the prevalence of sacrifice. How central it was to the ancient religions, including a Jewish religion that animals would be sacrificed to God or to the gods, right? How central it was to the way cities were organized. They always say, by the way, that as, as the Israelites approached the temple, they could smell it long before they could see it. It smelled like a great barbecue, all these animals being sacrificed. And we say, you know, how odd and how peculiar that is. Well, in a way, the logic of sacrifice is pretty straightforward. We take some aspect of God's creation and we symbolically return it to God as a sign of adoration, reparation, thanksgiving, sorrow. Does God need our sacrifice? No! It's an extremely important point theologically. We're not dealing with Greek and Roman gods, right, who were hungry and thirsty for our sacrifice. Sacrifice to me or I'll get angry with you. That's all mythology. That's not the biblical view. How could the creator of all things ex nihilo need anything from our little world? You see what I'm driving at? And don't you see it, for example, in, in the prophets and Psalms? You know, do you think I need the smoke of your sacrifices? It's not a question of, of God needing it. Rather, by these acts of sacrifice, we become rightly ordered. Aren't they acts of ad oratio? By these symbolic gestures, we become aligned unto God. We give back to God so that we can become ordered. Does that make sense? It's a really important point. Don't fall into a mythological understanding. We benefit from worship, not God. God doesn't need it, but we need it. And so we make sacrifice to the Lord. Look at these opening moves now in the liturgy of the Eucharist that we gather and bring forward gifts for the sacrifice. Now, bread, wine, water, and also money, right? Now, I know I'm going to sound like just a money-grubbing bishop when I say this, <laughs> but money is a, it's a very important liturgical moment. See, again, that's where people tend to look at the watch and you know, now they're, you know, they're collecting the money, you know. No, no, that's a liturgically important moment. Because think of that money. You know, most of us, oh, the little bread and wine and water in the back of church, we don't even think about it. I, I guess someone paid for those somewhere. and I, I, It doesn't really affect me. But isn't it true? When you reach in the old wallet and you have to pull out money and put it in the basket, that costs you a little bit. Because you know that money stands for, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. That money stands for hard work that you've done. That money stands for something you could use for things you need. It costs you a little bit. Good. Good. That's why it's important liturgically. It's an act of sacrifice. Now, the bread and the wine, those little elements that we barely notice. But see, they're meant to symbolize everybody the whole of the universe. Bread. To say bread is to say the baker that <laughs> made it, is to say the heat of the oven. To say bread is to say the wheat from which it came. To say the wheat from which it came is to say the earth and rain and the sun. To say the sun is to say the solar system. Same is true of the wine, right? 
the person that, that prepared the wine, to say that is to say the grapes from which it came, to say grapes is to say vine, to say vine is to say the earth and, the, and rainwater and the sun and to say the whole cosmos. In those little puny gifts, we're meant to see all of creation. Now see how important this is. Coming to this moment of adoratio. As we lead this great praise of God, we, the members of the mystical body, but in a way, all of creation. Which is precisely why the priest at that moment in the great Barakah prayer says, Blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation. For through your goodness, we've received the bread we offer you. See, the whole thing I've been saying is in those words. It's all of the universe now being presented to the king of the universe as a great act of sacrificial adoration. Does that make sense? That's what's going on in that part of the Mass. Now, in a Greek mythological context, the gods need this so they'll be satisfied and they maybe will be kind to us. That's not the biblical thing. What's the biblical view? Think now of, of the feeding of the 5,000. Lord, there's all these people. What are we going to do? Well, what do you have? Oh, nothing. It's a little bit. And it's, to feed so many, it's impossible. Give it to me. Say, give it to me. And you will find it's sufficient for the feeding of the multitude. When we give in a great act of sacrificial offering to God, what God doesn't need, God, in fact, now elevates and multiplies it for the feeding of the world. What happens at the Mass, everybody, is these little elements, these, these little container of bread and wine, which would barely satisfy the physical hunger of a couple of people, because God doesn't need it, will come back to us elevated, transfigured for the spiritual feeding of the world. That's what's happening in this great act of offering to the Lord. How about just a, a word about the, um, about the Eucharistic prayer and the power of the word? Karl Rahner, the great Catholic theologian, made a remark I've always found fascinating. He said, the Eucharist is a word event. The real presence is a word event. Now, what do you mean? Well, the Council of Trent said, Christ becomes really, truly, and substantially present. How? Vi verborum, Latin for by the power of the words. By Christ's words over these elements, they are transfigured and transubstantiated. Now, what does this mean? Well, think for a minute how our puny words can change reality. You know, if I say something to you that's very cruel, that can pierce you to the heart. That can change you psychologically for years. Think of a kid who heard some very harsh word from his parents or a teacher. Or turn it around, a word of, of praise and of gratitude. I mean, it can set you on a path, changes your life. I heard one of Thomas Aquinas' arguments for God's existence when I was 14, freshman in high school. Changed my life. There's no question about it. Set me on a path I've never left. That's true. Words, words changed me. Well, if that's true of our little words, how about God's word? Let there be light. And there was light. Let the earth come forth, and it came forth. Let animals teem upon the, the, sur the surface of the earth, and so it happened. In other words, God speaks things into being, doesn't he? Thomas Aquinas said that our language tends to be passive and descriptive. What he means is, like, oh, there were, I don't know, 4,000 people in this arena. So I, I came here, I took it in, and then I described it. Right? I didn't make this reality happen. I'm just describing it. Oh, but God's word, says Aquinas, is creative. What God says is. 
Who's Jesus? Oh, a great prophet. Oh, that's all he is, the heck with him. There's a, a thousand prophets, right? No, no, Jesus is the Word made flesh. The Word by which God makes the universe now becomes flesh, so that what Jesus says is. Little girl, get up. Talita kumi. And she got up. Lazarus, come out. And by God, he came out. My son, your sins are forgiven. And by that very act, his sins are forgiven. What Jesus says is, now, the night before he died, Jesus takes this Passover bread and pronounces, this is my body. Over the Passover cup, this is the chalice of my blood. Look, we can engage in little symbolic uh, activities. I, I could take my picture of the Beatles and say, let's have the, a gathering of the Beatles Society, and that picture will symbolize our love for the Beatles. Well, great. We can all do that. If that's all we're talking about, who cares? No, what Jesus says is. That's why we speak of his real, true, and substantial presence in the Eucharist. Ne next time you're at Mass, notice something that when the priest is doing the so-called institution narrative, describing what happened the night before Jesus died, he begins in the third person, right? Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples. So he's, he's telling you in the third person a story. But then, a very important moment, he then switches to the first person, gave it to his disciples, saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body. At that moment, the priest is most fully in persona Christi Capitis, in the person of Christ the head, speaking not his own puny words, but the words of Christ himself, which have this transformative power. And that's why we speak of this transubstantiation. Now, look, head and members knitted together turned now toward the Father to offer this great act of adoring sacrifice. What do we give the Father now? Not just symbols gathered from our ordinary earth, but now we can present to the Father the Son. And all of us united to Christ the Head. That's the moment, everybody. That's the moment of supreme adoration. That's the moment when we become properly aligned. That's the moment when creation is knitted back together. Now, does God need our sacrifice? No. Rather, any sacrifice we make breaks against the rock of the divine self-sufficiency and comes back to us. What happens to that sacrifice offered to the Father? It now comes back to us. We are now fed with the body and blood of Jesus. We're not mollifying an angry God, but no, in this great act of sacrifice, we ourselves become fed. There's the, the climax of the Mass, everybody. That's what we're there for. That's what the call and response was about. That's what the gathering was about, to bring us to that moment. Then lastly, and I'll bring this to a close. Having received the body and blood of the Lord, having eaten and drunk, we are now sent out. Do you have over here in England the, the book, the hymn book, Gather? Do you sing from that? I guess not. <laughs> it's very big in the States. It's a, it's a big songbook called Gather. Right? Well, one of the liturgical theologians I know in the States said, that's fine, but there should be a second hymn book called Scatter. <laughs> because, <laughs> because having gathered, having been fed, having been Christified, now we are sent out. 
Here's something that uh, there's, there's no uh, exception to this. Nobody in the Bible, there's no exception to this, nobody in the Bible is ever given an experience of God without being sent. This is not some kind of mysticism whereby I just go to the top of the mountain to commune with God. Everybody in the Bible, once they've encountered the Lord, sent. Fulton Sheen, the great American uh, preacher, said the Christian life is lived out in between two great commands, come and go. <laughs> Jesus says, come and follow me, come and stay with me, come and, you know, come apart and rest. But then invariably he says, go. He sends them out. Henri de Lubac, the great French theologian, said, after the words of consecration, the most sacred words of the Mass, and he was referring to the Latin Mass of his time, are ite misa est, are go, the Mass has ended. <laughs> after the, the words of consecration, the most sacred words are go. And look, everybody, we know this now. You don't have to fly over oceans to get to mission territory, do you, today? You walk outside the door of any church in the Western world, you're in mission country. You know, with this rising tide of secularism, and I see it every day, especially among the young, people losing a sense of God, losing a sense of the transcendent. They need us, everybody. They need us. We who have been Christified at the Mass, now we're sent to Christify the world. There's Vatican II in a nutshell, if you want. Lumen Gentium, right? The light of the nations is Christ. The idea of Vatican II wasn't so much to, you know, turn the church into the world. It was to turn the world into Christ. Go, go. The Mass has ended. Go and bring the light that you've seen. Bring the Christ that you've become to the world. And that's the missionary purpose of the Mass. Listen, God bless everybody. Thank you for coming today. And thanks uh, for listening. Thank you, sir. Jesus.